that I do study. And um, a little bit about myself is that I'm the head of prep research over at Protect AI. And I also run my own consulting company, which goes to help security teams um, basically focus on the wellness on our team, making sure people feel like they belong, but also be heard and having good strategies in place. Um, I'm also a podcaster for ITSP Magazine, uh, Secure Your Strategy, and then also a recent new board member for Diana Initiative. So we're going to talk a little bit about like what do I mean by marginalized genders, and then we're going to go to some current stats about marginalized genders in InfoSec. Then we're going to go into individual solutions, and that's the time when you want to have a buddy next to you. Um, then we're going to go into the community solutions and Q and A. I'm hoping to get about ten minutes for Q and A. If not, I'm sorry, but I can be outside there, and we can you can ask all the questions in the world. So I want you to first just imagine this scenario, okay? Before you were actually born, your parents found out the gender, the sex, what you're going to be. And at that very moment, all these ideas, family and friends started to be queued up of what you're going to be like based on your sex. When it came to your bedroom, they may have painted it blue, they may have painted it pink, Dresses were purchased. All of those things were purchased because of knowing what your sex is. When you're born, even the world has already assumed what your gender will be by wrapping you up in a pink blanket or a blue blanket. And then you know if you're intersex, that decision sometimes is not in your hands of do you pick a different sex? Your parents will make it for you or the doctors will make it for them, and you're not left to be able to have a conversation about what sex you want to be. And as you grow older, you may have been told as, you know, a female presenting girl, you should be playing with dolls, not with Legos, or you should be playing with cars, uh, you should be playing with dolls, and that's a good thing to be a good girl, right? At a very young age, we're told as that's what meant to be a good girl. What is a good girl? Well, it's to make sure we stay in a nice little thin box because if we go outside, discomfort starts to happen. Shame starts to occur because we're trying to form our own identity. And for boys, they're taught that they're only allowed to have little two emotions, which is anger and sex. You can get happiness too, don't be wrong. But when it comes to uncomfortable emotions, it's anger or sadness. But if you're sad, you cannot cry because the boys and men aren't supposed to cry. So at this state already, you're a little kid trying to explore the world, but people have already determined who you're supposed to be. And when you try to explore your individuality, that becomes a problem because they want you to be in these places. Because the world has been set up that there's only two genders, and that's based on sex. That if you're white, you're supposed to like the following things. If you're a girl, you're supposed to like the following things. And this has become a problem now. For us, as we're adults, for when we were teens, to really try to find out who we are outside of just gender normativity. And I'm not going to lie, Patriarchy, you're going to hear me say it a couple times because it's very real. It does exist, and it does not fit for anyone in this room, or even outside this room. Because it's forcing you to be something that maybe that's not who you are. If you're a boy, you're supposed to be like, not like dolls. It's so silly if you think about it, right? When you're born, they're telling you you're going to be playing all these things, you're going to get into this profession. It's more about having a conversation that maybe gender is on a spectrum. Or we're all somewhere on a spectrum, but maybe even the spectrum doesn't really exist for everyone. Not everyone can identify with one particular gender. And maybe for some, they don't even have a gender because they see themselves as something different, something who they are, and they don't want to label it. So when I talk about marginalized genders, what do I mean by that? That means anyone who is 
marginalize the community based on their gender. And that changes depending in what place you're in, right? For example, if you are attending an all-women's conference and you're the one man there, that would make you the marginalized gender there. So when I see marginalized genders, I really do mean everyone. Everyone is technically a marginalized gender. It just depends on the situation, the scenario, the, in the given situation. But the thing is, that's kind of the beauty of it, is that you get to assign your own gender, or you get to assign that like, you don't really want to have a gender. It's up to you. We're going to have everything. Because the reality is, gender identity is really within you. It's in your head. It's in your, the thoughts that you have. And it may not be displayed outwardly, but it's the conversation you have within yourself about what you think that you identify as. We also have sex assigned at birth, of course. That's the other thing. But then we have gender attribution, which is how people perceive us. They project to see what kind of gender we have based on what we're wearing, perhaps, or the way that we look. And then we have gender expression, which is how we display our gender. And that can change every single day. That can change, like, if you like to change your outfit twice a day, your gender expression can be totally different. But the one thing I really want to just push on is that you are not just your gender. You're all of this. You're so unique. I hope you know that. Because all this is what forms you to be you. And once again, you do not need to put yourself in a box. You do not have to label yourself if you don't want to. But somehow, sometimes, we want to connect with others that share that same terminology as we do. We want to find people to have connection in life. Because sometimes, when you're trying to break stereotypes of yourself and how you're being in the world, it can get very lonely. You have a lot of shame to deal with. Shame that should belong on you. Or like shame the fact that we are in this society that we can't be our unique selves. Because we're being seen as something a weird thing to another person. So we've covered what is marginalized genders. So now we're going to talk about cybersecurity here. And you're going to hear a lot of statistics. But first, before I do that, we gotta talk about DEI. Okay, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, when I talk about DEI, I'm gonna be honest, we don't have it. In our industry, we don't have it at all. Let's be real with one another here, okay? DEI does not exist right now. It's more on paper than anything. And we can see this over and over in so many examples. For example, in the Black Lives Matter, all these companies were like pushing out that they support the black community and everything, but then internally, within a year, all the initiatives are gone. We saw that with the V2 movement as well, where suddenly, you know, all these companies were getting concerned of harassment and everything like that. Then two years later, next thing you know, you cannot report these things anymore, you'll be slammed again. And it's one of those things that's really unfortunate because what that means for like our industry in particular is that how are we ever going to be secure if we can't have DEI? And by DEI, what do I mean? It means belonging. You cannot have belonging without diversity, equity, and inclusion. Together, that's how you get belonging. And I hope by attending this conference, you do see and feel that you are here and, and you feel appreciated for being your unique self. Because that's what we need to strive to be in this industry. And if we don't feel like we belong, then we start thinking about imposter syndrome. And the thing is, unfortunately, our community tends to be filled with imposter syndrome. But if you ever look at the history of the imposter syndrome, it was actually around college students that were women in the 70s, because they were the first ones to go to college and in these industries and these divisions and degrees where it was the majority were men. And so these women felt that they were inadequate, that they didn't know anything. They felt like they weren't there. But reality was is because there wasn't representation. They were the first ones. They felt like the first ones. And it's a very lonely path, but also an unsure path as well. So when I talk about imposter syndrome, it's a feeling that we all probably have and experience at some point in this industry. But I want you to know it's really not about your skills. You're skillful as hell. That's why you're here and why you're walking in. 
It's more the fact that when you go to your work, you don't feel included, perhaps. You feel like you can't voice your concerns because you might be the only person or the only person in the room. You don't want to be seen as something else that you're not. You want to be the person that fits in. But unfortunately, more than 75% of you know, cisgendered men do work in cybersecurity, and for women, it's less than 25%. And if you actually dig into the research of this kind of stuff, it gets even more sad because they do it by you know, titles. And for the women, they wanted to expand it so it looked like it was a higher number. But in reality, it was people at IT support, assistance. And so if you see that and understand that part in itself, that number is a lot lower. There was one research that did come out by Forrester, I believe, and in that one it said it was actually at 13%. So the reality, we don't really know what the number is because they've been inflated also at the same time because there's not a lot to do here to change. And then retrospectively, when you look at the percentages based on someone's ethnicity, Hispanic, African American, and Asian women, American, and Indian Native, Alaska women, it's four, nine, eight, and one percent. You probably have seen that there's these giant blocks of disclaimers on these slides. That's for you to keep an eye on too. And women's cybersecurity research showed that younger women face less severe pay discrepancies than the baby boomers generation. But there's real lack of progress as women's salaries still need to catch up. 17% 17, 17 of women earn 50000 to 99999 compared to 29% of men. And still, this is keeps showing over and over again that when it comes to women, getting those higher positions is incredibly hard to get. But also, getting the pay gap to reduce is incredibly worse than most other industries do. There's also evidence to suggest that among women who do choose to enter into cybersecurity, it's surprisingly high proportion tend to leave the field in relatively short order. How many of you guys know someone who entered the space that's a woman and left? And a lot of times people will say it's because the boys love atmosphere. Feeling like I can't go beyond this. It's not happening. Or too many of these situations where you're battling uh, protections that are being placed on you. One of the scariest things was when I came across this one in particular. So diverse slate, so when you're applying for a job, Includes two or more kids from any underrepresented group. So the thing about that is that when you have only one woman and one person who is black at a slave violence, there's statistically a zero chance that they will be accepted into that role. However, when you increase the number of a diverse slate of applicants, it does increase on a dramatic rise. So the whole thing that we need to do is make sure that we push people that are, you know, not cisgendered gender of white men, you know, men, but when you push people that are marginalized into the finalists, there's a higher shot for them to be accepted. But to get there is incredibly hard when you see people that don't believe in DEI and don't want to look into themselves in this area. Another way of showing this is, so this was a cool study. Cool but scary and sad at the same time. But so white employees see themselves as allies in the black women industry. So if you look here on the left side here, so for white women, they say that about 81% say that, you know, they see themselves as allies of black women. And then if you go to white men, it's 82% say that they are an allies of black women. But then if you come over on to this lovely side right here, the reality is very different. When asking the question of people that are black and women, do you feel like you have allies there? The number is so much worse and do not match with the left side here. As you can see, for white women, it's 42% versus the 81% over there. And for white men, it's 43% versus the 82% over there. 
And we see this also with black women severely underrepresented senior leadership. For example, for VIP roles, it's 1.6% versus for white men, it's 57%. And in C-suite positions, it's 1.4% versus 68% for white men. And I just want to point out that white men make 35% of the U.S. population. And it's not just that, but also when we're talking about queer women, is seen, being seen and treated very differently in the work office. We're dealing with microaggressions, and I just want to say that this content, there is no disclaimer in here, but it did not take in um, race at all. So I think we get heads up on here. But we can see here that when it comes to women on LGBTQ plus women are all, 82% do experience microaggressions. And if you see like the experience of any form of sexual harassment, it's quite high for bisexual women. And when we think about barriers of entry or barriers of a career and, and trying to get those higher positions, gender does play a role. So when you're cisgender and straight, you know, your gender plays about 22%. And if you're cisgender and queer, it's going to be 27%. If you're transgender and straight, it's 29%. But if you're transgender and LGBTQ+, plus, it's 53% so it's their gender. And if you saw all those disclaimers, it was trying to share something with you, which is that there's not enough information out there when it comes to research of folks that are non binary, near diverse, and trans. They're just completely missing from most studies when we talk about like representation in our space or even in the other industry. And that shows at the top, by the way. If you want to know when leaderships are trying to figure out are we doing good progress here? They usually will use the latest research to determine if we're doing well or not. And if that's not in the research, that means they're not going to have an idea of what they're supposed to do. They're not even going to be aware of the situation. And from all the wonderful data that we know, is that marginalized students aren't fully captured in the current studies. And the other problem that we have, there's a lack of representation when it comes to studying it. The researchers themselves are not represented in is. And this becomes a hard thing. That's why you don't see people that are, you know, non-binary in these research. Because there aren't researchers that are non-binary at this time that are pushing this forward. That's why you don't want to be the only one in the room, because if there's another person in this like you, you're going to be more comfortable to speak openly. And also to be backed up. So we're going to talk about solutions here. I want you to turn to someone sitting next to you. And I want you to introduce yourselves to that person. And get on. It is so rough and I hated it. 
But then again, like the practicality of wearing that dress, and then I want to go out and play at recess. So then I start wearing jeans. So I, but then you can feel like your expression has changed because of a scenario and situation. So this is something to think about, is how do you see your gender today versus when you were a child? And that's what I want you guys to talk about with your neighbors. So I'm going to give you about five minutes to talk it over. And then if you guys want to share some things out, we can do that too. It's up to how comfortable you all feel. Alright, so I'm going to give you guys five minutes to talk about your gender identity, or what you see yourself as, and so on. And yeah. <laughs> how is that experience for all? Okay. Anyone want to share any things that they came to conclusions or found similarities or found things that were unique that they would like to share? Yes. I can share a little bit. Um, I went into saying that I haven't changed my identity or anything. I, I kind of went into this like, oh, I'll just say that and then I'll be quiet. But then we started talking more and then I started thinking about my daughter and how I'm raising her. And we talked a little bit about our parents and how that's a time where I feel like I have to step in with parents from a different generation that have different views. And I was just telling her, like, I pick and choose my battles that time, but there's definitely parts where I feel like it's not okay or they're. Her identities being just like you opened up your presentation on things are being put on her, and I'm like, oh no, let's let her decide as she gets older. So it was a good exercise to walk through. I went in very close minded and I discovered something. So thank you. Yeah. What else? Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Christina. Um, I'll guess I'll just share my story, but I don't think I should share the stories. Um, but for me personally, as far as my gender identity, like I feel like I pretty much identify the same as I did when I was a child with she, her. But as an adult, I added the they, mostly because it's like a language decolonization thing, because the English has had um, effects on Chinese language. And so I'm trying to like decolonize that and take back my like, Chinese identity a little bit. So. Oh. Similar to that, we talked about 
using using your expression or your, your clothing for the day to your advantage or to your comfort level, whether it's like your personal advantage of this will make me avoid an uncomfortable situation, or I'm stepping into an environment where if I conform or don't conform explicitly, it might be to my advantage in that situation. Yeah, I would imagine that timelines are very different, right? So say if we had this question in the 1940s, we would not be able to dress in comfort. Let's be real. We'd have like these leather shoes for men that are like so hard to break into, and like women would be having to wear heels all the time, kid flats. Yeah, that would be a problem. I'm so glad we're not that. Okay, so overall, self-expression can be really fun when we give people the, the play time to explore what feels good to them. It becomes comfort or anything like that. And there's so many ways that we can present ourselves in the world. So, one of the other ones that I want to touch on is this one. What are some ways that you break gender stereotypes and tax norms attributed to your gender? I think for many of us, if you're female presenting, it's being a of security of the office is definitely one. But what else for your own individual self? And I'm going to talk it over. I'll give you two minutes. And go, yeah, two minutes. You've been trained. Congrats. <laughs> Okay, so the one thing I want to say before we do share is that there are gender stereotypes that try to tell us that people who identify as girls or boys should act or dress in a certain way, such as girls like dresses, boys don't cry. And these stereotypes can make people feel really bad for the things that they like to do. It also erases people who may identify or express themselves outside of the binary of masculinity and femininity or gender altogether. So I'm very curious to hear some shareouts of what you guys experience in your conversation. Any shareouts? Yes. Um, I had shared with the group that um, I break the the cis male straight stereotype through um, my expression of my emotions in what would be a non-masculine way traditionally, and also trying to make sure that tonic physical touch between straight men is acceptable. Like hugging and arms around each other and just close proximity is, is acceptable and, and normalized. Isn't that nice? I mean, like, I feel sorry for men because you've been trained to, like, not feel. Basically, anything you feel, just put it down. Go work out. Go drink a beer. It's never mm -hmm. like, have a conversation with your guy friends. Hug it out. It's so sad. What else? I'll go to you first and then I'll go to you. God, you, you touched on it earlier, but just being here for people that have kids or anything, you know, outside of work that people depend on you for, leaving them to put yourself first from here, I think is a big, a big deal for all of us. For me personally, my experience, my couple of previous jobs, when I started dating more than mine, they were like, you know, you're doing work, because you're not cooking for it, you're like, no, I don't have to cook for it. That's a spirit of life. I mean, that like raises your, your blood a little bit, like it starts going, like, excuse me, I'm supposed to be the cook in the nest and clean and do all these things and have people time to okay, how is that supposed to, and I'm not supposed to complain. Are you kidding me? Okay, yeah. right. and then you're supposed to dress up. Right? Yeah, you dress up. Yeah, you have to be for me. You guys got one hour for them here, yeah. right? That's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. All right, next one. This is the last one in this one, and then we're going to go into the solutions to wise. So, this one in particular, I want you to think of how does attribution change depending on what spaces you are in and who you're around. Can you think of moments when you may have read or addressed someone in a way that may not have honored how they identified on the inside? And then for this, I know this so hard with that latter question there. And I want to give yourself permission to be okay that you've made mistakes. Don't feel shame for something about this. You feel, okay, I need to do better next time, but don't hold that against you from exploring further on that front. So do give yourself, it's okay, you've made a mistake. Because that is what it is being a human, is we're going to make mistakes, but owning up to it and then continuing to keep learning, that's how we do better. So maybe you're only one minute in this one. I might give you more than that, I'll be honest. But, all right, go for it. <laughs> all right, what are some things that can be their conversations? And by the way, when people are sharing, please 
things don't start to look because we all make mistakes once again. It's already shameful for them to know that they still have that experience behind them. Now we have to still there yet. Anyone? Sorry, I thought you were expecting that. I can start. I think one of the biggest things that I have been working on and I'm trying to make others aware of as well is not assuming pronouns when you see an individual when they look like they may stereotypically be either more feminine or masculine. And just normalizing it when you first introduce someone to say, like, my name's Maggie, she, my friends are she, her, and having it like in your sick look at work, on your business cards, normalizing that conversation as much as possible so that we can, have, you know, as supportive allies, help make it just common practice for those who may already be as conscious of that. What else? So, so building directly off of that, the, the mess up I shared with the group was I had some in a virtual group. I had somebody who was non-binary and went by they them, and I had never made a mistake. And then we got together in a physical world space, and their expression, their presentation was feminine, and I messed up constantly when I had that that expression in front of me, and I had to constantly apologize for spending weeks never making a mis mispronoun mis and then misgendering the person uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, it's incredibly common. You know, you do feel bad that you're doing it because you're feeling empathy for the other person. Like, you don't want to hurt them. Maybe you feel bad about it. We've been trained to be a certain way for the longest time, and now we're going to have to rewrite that. And it takes time and practice and mistakes will be, you know, okay. Yeah. Um, I also said that, like, uh, my mistake is um, misgendering people, uh, specifically when I've known them as a different presentation and a different name for years. So it really is, a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, like a on my end that like that I need to like work on and things like that. So practice doesn't necessarily make it perfect, but it does make it better. Get into some solutions to me anyway. Yes, excited for this part. All right, so we're gonna have to take down the picture of you guys. I don't know what to tell you. Like, hack the planet and fuck the picture, right? But I'm gonna be honest, that's probably not gonna end up happening with us just in this room. However, we have all learned one thing in particular, which is it starts with us. It starts with us. That is the answer. Um, and the reason for that is because we have to monitor ourselves, making sure we're not projecting onto others, making sure that we take ownership for our actions. But the one thing I want to tell you about is when you're having conversations with people that don't believe in other genders or don't believe in certain things, it's very hard to convince them. It's one of those things that you cannot teach someone to have empathy. They have to want to learn it. And the thing is, it's like, yes, all of us do projections because that is how we survive in this world. We all do project. But when it becomes hurtful, that's, that's a different situation. So it's important for us to recognize that it starts with us, not them. It starts with us. Because that's how we can at least make one person feel better versus how our body may not make that person feel better. But solidarity does help tremendously. When you're not the only one in the room, it always feels more comfortable. But if you're an ally in the room, that's even better in some ways, too. But not better, but it, it does help the situation, I'll be honest. Um, when you have solidarity, think about it when you are someone in that room and you see a woman making a point during a conference, and then a male colleague decides to do exact same thing, and everyone's like, good job, Jeff! Good job, bravo, Jeff! And you're sitting in that call and you just saw that someone just ignored her response, which was exactly what he just said. Call that out. Do it immediately on the spot. You have the ability to do that because you already know that one person is uncomfortable in that room to make that point sometimes. So be that other person in the room and be in solidarity with one another. But solidarity also means to keep on learning from this conversation and many conversations that you're going to have this week, talk to people. Like those questions that you answered today, that helps people understand a little bit more about gender. It will help when you want to have conversations that can bring empathy to a table. Once again, you can't force people to have empathy, but you can at least have a conversation and see how that goes. And you can always walk out the door too. I'll be honest, it has happened before. But when I talk
talk about genders, and when I talk about the patriarchy, I'm not just saying it for women, I'm saying it for men too. It is all genders. We have to help one another and understand one another and all the different genders that are within this place right now. So they all feel like they belong. Because that's important. What if you want to feel like you belong somewhere? So why don't we do that to one another? And even though the world seems like chaotic and crazy right now in many ways, where DEI is now on the, the chopping board in certain states, or when trans rights is going out the window, and oh well, you know, once rights are definitely out, so we're over swing. The thing is, is not to stop. Don't stop having conversations. It's when you become quiet that no longer those rights are going to even have any say out there in the world. So be out there, talk about it, get people uncomfortable, get uncomfortable yourself because that's when change happens. And just don't stop, don't give up. Even if it seems like things just aren't going well, don't give up because honestly, you got to keep having conversations. By not having conversations, nothing is going to get better. Like I said, that collective action is very important. Keep having these conversations with one another. And having that radical self-acceptance, that's what it is all about. It's how you feel internally and how you want to share it with the world externally. And that requires a have safe environment. So we could do that, you know, we could do better than that. So summary. How many people saw the Barbie movie? I was, I'm going to put it out there, sorry, I'm a fan of it. Okay, cool. So do you all remember that scene with one of the actresses, she gave a monologue about how hard it is to be a woman in this world? I am not going to do acting for you in that bit, okay? I'm not going to do that. This is not the stage, and I'm a shy performer. So, what I'm going to do is, I took what basically was said there and changed it around for everyone in this room to feel a part of that speech. So, I'm going to give it a go. Let's go. It's long. <laughs> All right. It is incredibly challenging to be a human, regardless of your gender identity. Each and every one of us is so beautiful and so intelligent. You are. I mean, look at you guys. Like, look at yourself. I know there's a mask on. Seriously. But it is disheartening to see that many of us are struggling to recognize our own worth. Society places unrealistic expectations on all of us, and we're constantly finding ourselves grappling with contradictory standards. Men are told indirectly and directly they are not allowed to feel anything other than anger and sadness. And when they're sad, they're not allowed to cry. And we're told that we have to be fit in, in certain body ideals, but not too much or too little. And expressing our insecurities about it openly is often discouraged. Striving for financial stability is expected, yet asking for help with money is seen as a taboo. We're supposed to be strong and assertive leaders, but then it seemed too aggressive. And showing any signs of emotion or vulnerability is frowned upon us. Balancing work and personal life becomes a dying John Billion act, where we're expected to excel without any complaints. We're held accountable to the actions of others, even when it's unjust. Speaking about it can even lead to us being labeled as complainers. The pressure to conform to traditional roles as partners, parents, or career-oriented individuals can be overwhelming for everyone. In addition to all this, transgender individuals face their own unique challenges, navigating their identity and dealing with discrimination and misunderstanding from society, all the while they are expected to maintain an appearance that aligns with society's narrow perceptions of attractiveness. It's exhausting to watch ourselves, our friends, our family, and even every single day, even being here this week, you're going to feel this maybe. But it's exhausting to see how our fellow humans are twisting and contorting to gain acceptance and approval, and no one hands out a medal or says thank you for looking up to these unrealistic standards. Instead, we're often made to feel like everything that goes wrong is our fault. 
And when we defend seeing that it is not our fault, we are then seen as being difficult and dismissed. And I'm just so tired and when you see people of all genders and identities trying to mold themselves into societal expectations and feeling so much shame for just trying to be their authentic self. You are so beautiful, once again, this room, and you're unique as well. And whatever you, you feel lost or alone in this industry, I want you to know that you do not need to prove your worth to anyone. You belong here, and you deserve to be here just the way that you I will take questions, but I just want to say first a big thank you to Diane and Nisha for taking this talk and for you all to exist. And once again, have the planet and fuck the patriarchy. that serve cybersecurity were very anti-trans and that was incredibly disappointing and disheartening to find out in the field and I thought that that is very shameful and so my my co-founder and myself we tried to fundraise money and at this time across the US and companies even if they came out saying like they're pro-trans and everything they're really not they wouldn't donate anything because they were concerned about how their shareholders could see it or how their board would see it. And that became really disheartening. So it became a moment where we had to merge and we were like, we're going to merge with Diana Initiative because they understand what we're trying to do and we can work together because that's how you form a collective. It's not keep creating more orgs, it's about coming together because when we're together and bigger, we're stronger. Yes. How do you approach like some of those conversations? Like even in the we were instructed to encourage in a safe space to have some of those gender conversations, feels anxious that you might offend somebody either in in asking questions or follow-ups to their comments or sharing your, your own views. How, how do you approach that, particularly if you're trying to do it in a you know, work environment? Yeah, I would say like you can start saying like, say you're eating a meal, okay, you're with your team. You're like, yeah, I saw this this really interesting talk about like gender normativity, and it really just like it gave me a lot of thoughts. And then see how they react. If they're like, okay, you know, don't have a conversation. That's not a safe space to have a conversation. But if they're like, oh. Tell me more, or it's like, oh, gender, or something like that. Then have the conversation, but you really want to get a, a sense of the environment if you're in a safe environment to have a conversation like that, because not everyone is open to that. Any other questions? Uh, you help keep people talking because many people who are marginalized and many genders try to break Yeah, I think. Right now, especially with what's going on like in Florida and other places in the world, it is scary. And that's why I think allies need to stand up more in those type of situations. Because if allies stand up and pass some light to folks, I think that they're getting hurt a little bit more. You still need your like cis white male allies because they're going to be the ones that are going to help make a difference. It can't just be on the trans folks to make a change for the rest of the U.S. It has to be getting an ally. So that means have those conversations over drinks and be like, hey, you want to become an ally? Here, let me tell you how. And tell them what you need. Be instructive with that. All right, I think we're at time. But I'm going to be around here, so if you have any questions, you know, feel free to come up. But thank you.